Hi, I'm Jeffrey Montes de Oca. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about something called nationalism, which, as you probably already know, is really important in the world of sports. It's also really important to sociology because it gets at one of our most basic concepts, social solidarity. These are, this is the invisible bonds that holds a community together. It was also a central concept in the work of one of the most eminent sociologists, a man by the name Emil Durkheim. He studied it in all of his work, but maybe most famously in his work on religion, which he says religion is a social force that brings people together so they can see their commonality and make visible the invisible moral and emotional bonds that holds a community together. The problem that he saw is that modernity causes a general process of secularization. With the decline of religion, he asked, what is going to hold society together? Without traditional symbols of nation, such as the church and the king, new symbols needed to be born that would hold a large, heterogeneous population together. The flag, according to Durkheim, is a sacred symbol with religious significance because it symbolizes an entire community. Symbols are necessary to the constitution of a nation because it gives material form to abstract concepts. As individuals, our identities form through group membership as we become members of a group such as our family, a church, a school, and indeed also the nation. What we do, Durkheim explains, is we project all of the best qualities of ourselves onto sacred symbols and thus onto the nation. So, because we see ourselves in the symbols. This is why when a sacred symbol is desecrated, we experience it as an attack not upon a piece of cloth or ceramic object, but as an attack upon our group, which is an attack upon ourselves and our core values. Let's start thinking about uh, the slogan of the French Revolution, and I especially want to focus on the last term, fraternity, or the brotherhood of the nation. In this sense, the nation is understood as having a masculine familial quality that links together lots and lots of otherwise unrelated people into a single community. But this is a very special kind of community. It is what Benedict Anderson calls an imagined community. Think of it like this. Of all the thousands, if not millions of people that you will come within 100 feet of in your lifetime, and I don't even mean talk to, I mean the general proximity of, what percentage of the population of your nation will that be? I live in the U.S., and if I come within 100 feet of 10 million people in my lifetime, that isn't even close to 1% of the total population. All the same, I can feel an emotional connection to those hundreds of millions of people that I will spend my entire life completely oblivious to. A harm to one of those oblivious people can also be experienced as a harm to me. Think about things like Pearl Harbor, or more recently, September 11, 2001, in the United States. We might be in a single community called the United States, or whatever your nation is, but our relationships are abstract. They only exist in our imagination since those, those relationships don't exist in an actual physical community. We might also think about the space of the nation. I may crisscross my nation... But in reality, I'm only in my lifetime going to see a very, very tiny sliver of the actual territorial space of the nation. And so again, the space of the nation, just like the community, is abstract. So nationalism is like a religious force operating in society that allows strangers to see themselves united in a sociological entity 
that travels collectively through time. It makes explicit the invisible bonds of community. Picking up on the question posed on the previous slide, it's fascinating to see the different ways that the female body operates within the fraternity of the nation. It can serve as a symbol of motherland, giving birth to its citizens, as we see here with Lady Liberty and Britannia. It can also serve as a site of anxiety and vulnerability. This imagery, as you can see in these wartime propaganda posters, often mobilize racialized anxieties, where the female body is, sim is, uh, symbolizes, uh, of, is symbolized as a vessel of the race and nation. And race and nation are generally closely aligned. And in colonial discourse, it can be used to imagine virgin territory, that unlike the tired, over-farmed motherland, has never received a man's plow, so she beckons for penetration. We see Hawaii in this cartoon as a ma maiden beckoning to the United States. Something that I hope is clear is that nationalism needs symbols. Symbols like flags give a material presence to the abstract concept of nation. When looking at baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevy, as well as the Statue of Liberty in Pikes Peak, we can see that flags are not the only sacred symbols of the nation. These symbols of nation that we see everywhere become a banal aspect of everyday life. It is not just in highly ritualized moments, like elections, parades, and standing for the national anthem, that the nation is produced. Tiny bits and pieces of everyday life work in unnoticed ways to naturalize this abstract thing called the nation and to generate nationalism, which of course is the emotional attachments we feel to an abstraction. We oftentimes draw a distinction between patriotism and nationalism. Both patriotism and nationalism are expressive forms of national attachments central to the development of modern nation states. Patriotism is generally understood as our rational, healthy love of self, so it's inward looking. Nationalism is generally understood as their pathological hatred of others, so it's outward looking. However, Michael Billig argues that patriotism and nationalism are two sides of the same coin. One is positive while the other is stigmatizing. But both naturalize the dominant political economic order and the unquestioned belief that some things are more valuable than life itself. In this sense, they manage people's bodies and labor power by managing their emotions and their identities. As you are probably already aware, sport creates a powerful space of the nation and banal nationalism. The images I'm showing here are very U.S. heavy, but you can really insert any modern nation in these slots. What makes sports such powerful vehicles of nationalism is a great topic to discuss in your class or in reflection papers. Some of the things that I recommend thinking about are... For instance, why exactly are flags and national anthems so intimately tied to sporting events? I mean, what exactly is the connection between nation and structured human movement? How does sport mobilize our emotions and feelings of attachment? Similarly, what is the role of the media and its dramatic style of storytelling in constructing nationalism? I always think about Al Michaels shouting, do you believe in miracles, when the U.S. hockey team beat the Soviet team at Lake Placid in the 1980 Olympics, and how that clip gets endlessly replayed. If you're unfamiliar with this, I suggest looking, at, looking the video up online. Like the flag and anthem, why do we see the military at sporting events so often? Also think about what connections do militaries tend to have with sports in addition to the color guard and flyover that I show here.
Why are sporting events so closely tied to national holidays, our secular holy days? In the U.S., before the rise of the Super Bowl, Thanksgiving was the biggest day for football out of the year. Also, and this is an important question, why do we say things like, we won or we lost, when teams representing our nation compete at the Olympics, when most of us have never even been to the Olympics as fans, let alone competed for the national team? I hope my talk gives you some ways to think about nationalism sociologically as well as as a nationalist. Thanks.